One of the persistent realities of history is that the facts which we inherit as descriptions of historical events are not neutral. They are invested with the biases of individual and or group participants. Those who have survived or, more significantly, those who have acquired sufficient power to control how that history is written. One of the earliest documented musical instruments based upon electronic principles was the clavecin electric, designed by the priest Jean-Baptiste de Labor in France in 1759. The device uses keyboard control based upon simple electrostatic principles. The spirit of invention which immediately preceded the turn of this century was synchronous with a cultural enthusiasm about the new technologies that was unprecedented. Individuals such as Bell, Edison, and Tesla became cultural heroes who ushered in an ideology of industrial progress founded upon the power of harnessed electricity. Amongst these assemblage of inventor industrialists was Dr. Thaddeus Cahill, inventor of the electric typewriter, designer and builder of the first musical synthesizer, and, by default, originator of mu industrial music. While a few attempts to build electronic music instruments were made in the late 19th century by Alyssa Gray, Ernst Lawrence, and William Duddle. They were fairly tentative or simply curious byproducts of research into electrical phenomena. Cahill's invention, the Teleharmonium, however, remains the most ambiguous attempt to construct a variable electronical musical instrument ever conceived. By the end of the 1920s, a large assortment of new electronic musical instruments had been developed. In Germany, Jörg Maga had been experimenting with the design of new electronic instruments. The most successful was the Sphetophone, a radio frequency oscillator based keyboard instrument capable of producing quarter tone divisions of the octave. Maga's instrument used loudspeakers with unique driver systems and shape to achieve a variety of sounds. In 1937, the Warbur Foreman organ was one of the first truly polyphonic electronic instruments that could be considered a predecessor of current electronic organs. Its designer, the German engineer Harald Bode, was one of the central figures in the history of electronic music in both Europe and the United States. In 1939, Homer Dudley created the voter and the vocoder for non-musical applications associated with speech analysis. The voter was a keyboard-operated encoding instrument consisting of bandpass channels for the simulation of resonance in the human voice. The vocoder was a corresponding decoder, which consisted of an analyzer and a synthesizer for analyzing and then reconstituting the same speech. The machine uses only two sounds produced electrically. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. In the next selection, the computer sings a familiar ditty. Piano students will notice that the music-producing computer has a rather stylized left hand. Music can now be produced entirely by electronics. This is music with a strictly electronic beat, 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 The influence of World War II upon the arts was obviously drastic. Most experiment created activity sees and technical innovation was almost exclusively dominated by military needs. European music was the most seriously affected with electronic music research remaining dormant until the late 1940s. Fast forwarding past World War II is easy to assume that we were brought into a century as a utopian and vaguely romantic passion, namely that technology offered an opportunity to expand human perception and provide new avenues for the discovery of reality subsequently evolving through the 1960s and into the intoxication with this humanistic agenda as social critique and counterculture movements erupted. The irony is that many of the artists who were most concerned with technology as a counterculture social critique built tools that ultimately became the resources for an industrial movement that is in large part eradicated their ideological concerns. 
Most of these artists and their work have fallen into the anonymous cracks of a consumer culture that now regards their experimentation merely as inherited technical research and development. It is disco music, you know, so it's not really that much different. See, the thing about it is that in the middle, like in the early, in the middle 70s, you know, in the uh, early 80s, um, it was all disco music then, you know, there's so much stuff that was produced, I mean, and really produced well and put out on the market, you know, and the thing about it is that a lot of it got past the city, you know, and the city on a whole, but as far as like, you know, the warehouse was concerned, it was the only after I was put here. You know, and I was allowed to get away with anything I wanted to when it came to, you know, putting music on for them. You know, and people accepted that. It it's originally was more like basement tapes type of a thing done on four tracks and, uh, you know, put together real quickly. And it's evolved a lot more into more 24 track recordings. And I think it gave a, it was an outlet, you know, for musicians who had never had an outlet to, to you know, put their stuff on the air. They can put it, now they're putting it in the club. And it hits, a lot of it hits the club before it hits the radio. Whether the current users of these tools can resist the redundancy of industrial determined design biases induced by the clinches of commercial market forces depends upon the continuation of a belief in the necessity for alternative voices willing to articulate that of which the status quo is unwilling to hear. Whichever way the evolution of electronic music unfolds will depend upon the dynamical properties of a dialectual synthesis between industrial forces and the survival of the modernist belief in the necessity for technology as a humanistic potential. <laughs>